In the last lecture, we showed how a neural network of three neurons was able to solve a problem that a single neuron could not. This was to give the intuition for how we can build up a network of single neurons working together to provide solutions for more complex problems. Well, there's actually a mathematical theorem that states that a single layer neural network with mild assumptions on the forms of the activation functions of its individual neurons can represent any continuous function and therefore theoretically be able to find solutions for a whole wide range of problems. This is known as the universal approximation theorem for neural networks. In this lecture, I'm going to provide the intuition for the universal approximation theorem by showing a sketch of an informal proof that demonstrates how a neural network can be used to represent any one-dimensional function. We're going to start by considering a single neuron that receives one-dimensional input. Let's assume this neuron has a step activation function. Remember that for a single neuron model, the values of the weights and bias determine the value at which the output of this neuron transitions from a 0 to 1. For our one-dimensional example, we only need one weight value. Let's fix this weight to be equal to 1 and see how changing the bias changes the output of this neuron. If the bias term is 5, then the sum is 1 times the input x plus 5, and that means for all input values that are less than negative 5, the value of the sum will be less than 0. So when the sum is fed through the step activation function, this neuron is going to output a 0. For all values of the input x that is greater than or equal to negative 5, the sum will be greater than or equal to 0, and feeding this through our step activation function means that the neuron will output a 1. We can shift the value of the input where the model transitions from outputting a 0 to 1 by changing the value of the bias and keeping the weight fixed at equal to 1. So we can see that if the bias is 15, the transition happens at negative 15. If the bias is 10, the transition happens at negative 10, etc. Now we know how to construct single neuron models that can output a function that transitions from 0 to 1 for any value of the input that we'd like. These single neurons effectively behave like step functions that can transition at different input values. Now consider two such step function neurons. The one shown at the top transitions at x equals negative 2, and the bottom neuron transitions at x equals negative 1. Let's feed the outputs of these two step function neurons into a third neuron and ask the third neuron to subtract the output of the second neuron from the output of the first neuron. Again, the third neuron needs to find the appropriate weights and value of the bias to do this computation. This third neuron is now receiving two-dimensional input. The first dimension is the output from neuron 1, and the second dimension is the output from neuron 2. In order to perform a subtraction, the third neuron needs to weight the input from the first neuron with the weight value 1, and weight the input from the second neuron with a weight value of negative 1. When the third neuron weights the input it receives from the second neuron with a negative 1. It's basically receiving an input from neuron 2 that behaves like this, the inverse of a step function. Because we just want the third neuron to subtract the output from the second neuron from the output of the first neuron, we don't need a bias, so we're going to set the bias to 0. And let's give the third neuron our typical step activation function. We can now see that if we take the two outputs of two step function single neurons, 
where the second neuron's transition point is slightly shifted over from that of the first neuron, and then we use a third neuron that subtracts the output of the second neuron from the output of the first neuron. The output of this third neuron is now a thin rectangle as a function of the original input. So in summary, two neurons that produce step functions can be combined into a third neuron that produces a rectangle. We can shift the position of this rectangle depending on what the biases are for the first two input neurons. And now we can compose together as many neurons as we need, which output thin rectangles with positions at different locations. And let's take all these neurons that output thin rectangles at different positions and feed these neurons into yet another neuron. This final neuron that takes in all the different rectangle inputs, we're not going to use the step activation function anymore. Instead, we're going to give this final neuron a rectified linear unit activation function, also known as ReLU. So under ReLU, if this final neuron's sum of weighted inputs and bias is less than zero, we will output a zero, which is the same as it was with the step activation function. But now, if the sum is greater than or equal to zero, unlike the step activation function, we're not going to output a one, but with ReLU, we're going to output the value of the sum itself. So if the sum value is equal to one, we will output a one. If the sum value is equal to two, we're going to output a two. If the sum value is three, we're going to output a three, etc. As the final part of our proof that a neural network can represent any one-dimensional function, we're going to have this final neuron define a weight for each of its inputs, which are these rectangles. We can have this final neuron weight the inputs of all the different shifted rectangles to whatever height that we need in order to create any arbitrary function. So for example, to create the function on the right, we would weight inputs from a neuron that produces a rectangle at zero with a weight value of five. And then because this final neuron has a ReLU activation function, the final output from the final neuron will be a rectangle of height 5 positioned at 0. The nonlinear function that we're trying to recreate is rising at this point. So to capture this, we can use input from another neuron that outputs a rectangle, but a rectangle that's slightly shifted over from 0, and now we're going to use for our final neuron a slightly larger weight to weight this slightly shifted over rectangle. For example, we can use a weight value of 5.2 for this rectangle. And now we're matching the shape of this nonlinear function by building it up with rectangles. To capture the next point in this nonlinear function, we can take the input of another neuron that outputs a rectangle slightly shifted over again, and then weight it as appropriate to match the shape of our nonlinear function. And this is how we can output any nonlinear shape for a one-dimensional function. If we did this computation for neurons that produced arbitrarily thin rectangles, which we can do by making sure the shift between the first neuron and the second neuron is smaller and smaller, we can create any one-dimensional function this way. Remember that the universal approximation theorem said that we could represent any function with a single hidden layer neural network. What I've shown you is this rectangle summing calculation for a network with two hidden layers and one output layer. I did this because it's easier to systematically explain the computational steps. But actually, all the neurons in our second hidden layer were doing the exact same computation in response to the entire data range, which is basically multiplying one input by a weight of one and the other input with a weight of negative one for a bunch of shifted step functions. Because these second layer neurons were doing all the same computations in terms of weights and zero bias, and also they were all representing functions that don't interfere with each other because they were producing uniquely positioned 
non-overlapping rectangles, so there was no interference between what they were outputting. Because of this, we can subsume the computations of all the second layer neurons into the computation of the final layer neuron and just have the first hidden layer, which was creating these step functions, feed directly into the output layer, which is our final neuron, and have our final layer output neuron use the both positive and negative weights for each of the step function neurons, and effectively take over the computation that was previously separated into a second hidden layer. Now we've shown how a neural network with a single hidden layer can represent any function in one dimensions. This is not a complete mathematical proof of the universal approximation theorem, but it's an idea of a proof to give an intuition using a one-dimensional example how neural networks can be assembled to approximate many functions. And I hope you can trust that a similar idea holds in higher dimensional spaces. Well, now we've shown this very powerful theorem about neural networks with single hidden layers being able to represent any function. So why do we need deep learning? Why do we need neural networks with many layers? Well, we always have to read the fine print that comes with mathematical theorems. And when we do, we find that there are caveats to the universal approximation theorem. And these caveats include the stipulations that the layer might be infeasibly large and may fail to learn and generalize correctly. This means that even though theoretically we could build a one hidden layer neural network to approximate any function, there is no guarantee that we actually could do this in practice with one hidden layer and train this neural network to be able to generalize to new data in a way that's sufficient. And while in reality, there are actually many cases for which a one hidden layer neural network will do the job just fine for your modeling needs. Sometimes it is the case, though, that we do need many hidden layers to allow us to learn the effective feature representations that allow us to map inputs to outputs that can generalize to new data appropriately.